Well, thank you very much. It's a great uh, pleasure for me to be here. Thank you very much for coming along. I'm, of course, an admirer of what Ron Lee has written on intergenerational equity, generational accounts, national transfer accounts over the years. And I'm a lay person. I'm not an academic. I'm, I'm a visiting professor at King's College in London. I'm not a career academic. So I apologize in advance because I don't have the full level of uh, academic sophistication that Ron has. I'm a, in some ways a lay consumer who tries to take the literature, which I try to follow, and then present it and interpret it in a way that's relevant for politicians and policymakers. And I now have a role as the chair of the Think Tank, the Resolution mm -hmm. Foundation, and we were delighted to have Ron there last year, um, which has an intergenerational centre that I run. But is the source of a lot of the up-to-date statistics which appear in the same edition of my book, <laughs> The Pinch, which I think you all need to check whether or not it's available on Amazon. Uh, I'm going to give you mainly British evidence, and uh, of course you'll know much better than me the American evidence, and it can be your judge to what extent my account of what's happened in the UK has any parallels with the issues that you face here in the US. Uh, the sort of underlying political philosophy in the book is that the contract between the generations is the key part, is the key element of the social contract, is what holds society together. And probably one of our great post-war thinkers in political thought, the American John Rawls, in his book, The Theory of Justice, buried in his, in his his attempt to formulate a social contract behind a veil of ignorance where we have no religious beliefs, specific cultural identity, the one thing he smuggles in that's crucial for the contracting parties is he calls them, and this already sounds a little bit old-fashioned, it's crucial for his argument, he calls them heads of families. So he puts an intergenerational element into the contracting parties in his most basic theory of the social contract, which tells me that when, even when you strip everything else away, you don't know if you're a Christian or a non-Christian, if you're male or female, American or Asian, you are supposed to be the head of a family. In other words, thinking of something beyond your own lifetime. So I think it is fundamental. And in Britain, and I suspect this is something that's shared in America, um, there's a belief that one of the, part of the promise, certainly, of modern business capitalism is every generation should have a high standard of living than the one that came before. Uh, and that the and that's how we measure. And also, we have an obligation to care for older generations. So these two propositions, uh, where well, we provide for older generations, every generation have a higher standard of living. I think capture some fairly basic assumptions about what modern modern society should do. However, in Britain, there is widespread concern that a key part of that contract is not being honoured. Anxiety about whether the younger generation are going to have a better life. And their parents. And you look at that, you've basically got half the population who believe that young people will not have a better life than their parents. This is a significant deterioration in optimism about the prospects of the younger generation. Now, it may be that old Britain is a melancholy place, and buoyant, optimistic America has completely different attitudes. I, I rather suspect that there is, however, a problem a bit like this in the US as well. So uh, there, is a, there is an anxiety that the, that the previous generation have had things gone well for themselves, and for the young generation, it's not going to be so good. Now, this is, the, this is an empirical slide, which in my, it plays a crucial role in my argument. And this is for the for Britain. This is cru this isn't fertility rates or anything sophisticated like that. This is just simply the actual number of babies born in Britain uh, over more than a century. Uh, and it tells a story not completely unlike America's. You know, very high rates of million million babies through the 19th century, big plummet in the First World War, then the Depression, very low birth rates. Then, incidentally. The time when Keynes is writing his general theory, a lot of worry about demand, who are the consumers of the future, and Keynes himself very interested in demography, underestimated as an element in his thought. And we then have the post-war baby boom, and our post-war baby boom has a slightly different shape than yours. Yours is a kind of plateau, 
Ours is two peaks, 1947, 1964, two years when we had more than a million babies born, and a low point in, in the middle of 800,000 babies, which is still pretty high. And of course, as you know, these are, these are not sort of official measures. These are just um, definitions that have been emerging as a kind of mix of a demographic and a cultural element. So I think it'd be a shared view in Britain that baby boomers were born 1946 to 65. You can then see in every sense this small generation, Gen X, the birth rate plummeting, uh, and the millennials going through a mini cycle. But the, at no point since the baby boom has the number of babies born exceeded 800,000. And during the baby boom, it never fell below 800,000. That's how I see it. Now, the the classic doctrine from Malthus to uh, America's more recent, so America's more recent demographic thinkers has been that um, the face with the question, which each of you individually might like to reflect on, if you had a choice between born, being born in a big cohort or being born in a small cohort, what would you choose to be? And the, well, what would your answer be, Sam? <laughs> yeah, the, the kind of common sense answer is small cohort. It looks like your option to go through life business class, not economy class. You know, <laughs> you are, less competition in the jobs market, less competition in the housing market. It looks obvious that being a small generation is a good deal. My argument is that in a modern society, it's turned out to be the opposite. It's turned out that being a big generation has worked to the advantage of the big generation, contrary to what was expected from Malthus onwards. And my argument is that this is a crucial feature of modern capitalism. First of all, if you're a big generation, you have market power, which is why the Rolling Stones are still on tour. And why you can buy, certainly in Britain, an updated version of a Volkswagen Beetle and a Mini. These, the taste of this very large generation shape markets even as we age. So in, in our modern market economy, being a big cohort of consumers shapes markets around our interests. Secondly, in a democracy, we're a very large voting cohort. And even without thinking of it like this, we have tended to vote for policies that match our interests and preferences. In the UK, I don't, again, I don't know the American figures, uh, basically for every baby boomer who votes, there are now uh, about uh, 530,000 voters of exactly the same age, actual voters. And for every young person who votes, there are 400,000 voters of exactly the same age. The Brexit vote, a sad story for another occasion, the Brexit vote was above all an um, old person's vote. Young people voted for me. So insofar as there's a core proposition in my book, it's that things have worked out for the boomers because they're a big generation, not despite being a big generation. Now, I'm going to take you through the evidence, and I'm sorry, this is British evidence, and again, you can tell me how, how um, it ties in with the US, and much of it comes from my think tank. And by the way, I should explain, when I use the term generation, I'm referring to those birth groups that I identified earlier. When I use the term cohort, in order to make precise comparisons, I'm talking to five-year birth groups, five-year cohorts. And a lot of analysis is different five-year cohorts. And this is weekly pay for the median weekly pay of, uh, sorry, hourly pay, sorry, hourly pay of people born in these five year slots. And first of all, of course, there's what we would expect. Every successive cohort, their weekly pay goes up. But look around here. Here you see that for the cohort uh, born in the Let's see, uh, 1976 to 80, and then the later cohort, born 81 to 85, there's no longer uh, any significant progress over after the age of about 25. And then the cohort coming on, born 86 to 90, are even further behind. So in other words, after that 
classic process of every five years their pay is higher, we're now in a period where someone aged 30 in Britain today is on average earning less than someone aged 30 uh, to 10 years ago. So the driver in the jobs market of pay rises, successive groups, birth groups, birth categories, that seems to have come to an end. Now, for any one of these you can think of special factors, this, to some extent this is the post-crash economy. But every, if every time there's a special factor, you kind of wonder why do all these special factors all work the same way. So anyway, the wage, the increase in wages for the young generation that we were familiar with looking around this room, most of us, when we started, is no longer functioning in the UK. Now this is a, I think I'm not going to take you through the, the next the complexity of the next stage. Of it. In the think tank, we're trying to dig down into why is pay not going up. And one reason that pay is not going up is that young people aren't moving jobs as much as they used to. And one reason they're not moving jobs, and they're certainly not moving jobs that involve moving where they live, is that the, in the high wage areas that they should move to, rents have gone up so much that the, the benefit of the high wage is entirely taken by the landlords charging higher rents. So there isn't actually, when you look at your income after housing costs, a market incentive to move to a high paying area. That essentially is our argument at my think tank, and it's about the decline in job moves, and it's particularly the decline in job moves of uh, people who move house as well, which we think is an important factor. I won't take you through all the detail in the charts, but that's basically what we're showing. And this matters because something else that's happening is many more of our young people are in rented accommodation and for a lot longer. So private renting has become more significant and owner occupation of housing is less significant. And this tells you, comparing the, this lower line is the proportion of people of different ages who are in the private rented sector, the grey, blue line. And it tells you what we kind of expect. There's a surge when you're in your 20s, when you're in the private rented sector, but as soon as you get into your 30s or 40s, you're out of it, and children are by and large not being raised in the private rented sector. And this red line is Britain as it is today, with not only many more young people in the private rented sector, but many more families with young children in the private rented sector. And Ron kindly referred to my involvement in policy over the decades as an official in the British Treasury, as an advisor in number 10 to Margaret Thatcher, as an MP, a minister. And I tell you, a lot of social policy just assumed most families were in the just kind of an unstated assumption. Um, we're now at the stage where you know, a quarter of, fa of families where kids are starting school in the private, living in the private rented sector with very modest uh, rights to stability of occupation. This is not social renting, this is not traditional council housing, this is paying a landlord and he or she has the right to move you on after uh, three to three months notice. So, an increase in private renting. And when, when uh, and this is, a, I think, a really interesting objective measure, because some, one of the answers is people say, well, okay, you've got all these financial indicators, but nevertheless, young people are better off. Uh, they've, got modern, they've got modern smartphones. There was nothing like this when I was a child. On the other hand, we've all got smartphones. And uh, when my argument that there's a problem for the younger generation is not saying that the fundamental wheels of technological innovation have stopped turning. There will be new products and new services being developed. The question is whether we find that the quality of life is getting better. And this is a really important measure of quality of life, which is simply the amount of physical space you occupy at home. And it tells us that so far in, the, in, the, in about 20 years, we're basically um, 20 years up to now. If you look at the at owners, people who are owner occupiers, the, the purple dot is how much space they had in 1996, and the green dot is how much space they had in 2013. And it tells you that owner occupiers, be they under 45 or aged over 45, have got more space now than they had then. So if you're an owner occupier, there's been a benign trend that you've got more space. Most owner occupiers, however, are aged over 45. In reality, this is saying we, the older generation, have got more space. 
for private renters, and the private renters are the under 40s and a growing number, for the private renters, the amount of space they have is shrinking. Uh, be they under 45 or over 45, but most of them are under 45. So when you get to the fundamentals of quality of life, you just how much space you have got in your living accommodation, it's basically pretty clear. The boomers are creating more and more space, and the younger generation is having less and less space. That is quite a fundamental measure of the quality of life, which is changing. And I think it's one of the reasons for the association of young people that people say they want to go out all the time and they they have uh, they always have meals out and never cook themselves. It's partly they're driven out by the fact that their domestic accommodation is much more. Uh, when you look at, I began with the picture of what's happening on their pay. When you add in housing costs, what is left for you to consume after you have to meet the cost of your housing, the figure, the pattern is even more dramatic. So you can see for the people aged over 65, their real disposable incomes. Per, uh, per person gradually rising through this century. Uh, the opposite extreme, the purple line, is people aged 18 to 29, and you can see that has been declining since the start of the millennium and has now gone below that of the over 65. So the, their wages are rising. That's the first problem. Their housing costs are rising. Second problem. They're more likely to be in the rented sector with less space, third problem. And once you've allowed for this expensive housing accommodation, the decline in the amount of money that they've got actually to spend on personal consumption is even more dramatic than what's been happening for them. So that chart I began with showing people worry about the prospects in general, the younger generation is not some irrational fear driven, whipped up by media reporting. There is real evidence that things are getting tougher for the young generation in the <clears throat> declining personal consumption. Uh, now, there are other longer term uh, measures, and I, 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 one of the, what, actually one of the things I should confess now is an omission, which is I have only have a brief discussion of environmental issues. In some way, I just, I, I focus on economics, on income, on growth, on the political thought of the social contract, and then also cover the environment, because to be honest, uh, it would have become a book in its own right. But this is just one measure of the scale of the climate change emergency and what it means for different generations. To summarize, what this tells me is that our boomer generation, in the course of our lives, if you look at the amount of cons uh, tons of carbon dioxide that we will have emitted, especially in prosperous parts of the world like Europe, and compare it with the amount of carbon dioxide that the younger generation will be able to emit in their adult lives that is consistent with holding global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. And for that to happen, the younger generation can only consume, can, sorry, can only emit one eighth of the carbon dioxide in their lives that the boomers are likely to emit. So if you add in the environmental effect of dealing with, uh, with uh, global warming, you see another massive adjustment in the lives of younger people in order to offset the effects of our carbon dioxide production. That's my opening image in my book, is that we so often have, I don't know if you get in the American media, a story, there's a classic kind of newspaper cliche of, Parents go off for the weekend and find that their kids have held a party and it's been advertised on Facebook and the house has been trashed and they come back on Sunday evening and find mayhem and a mess. That's the, I say, well, that is a powerful media image. If anything, what's happening in our society is the opposite. We are trashing the place and expecting our kids to sort out the mess. So there is an environmental aspect as well. I just have to register that, and it's very significant, very profound. Um, but I only really discuss it in one chapter because it's an overwhelming issue in terms of. Well, uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Um, I'm just noticing that 
the 65 plus used to have much lower consumption uh, and now it's become more nearly equal, but the 18 to 29 year olds were uh, really quite high. It's true they dropped some, but their relative position remains, uh, let's say at least equal or... Uh, well, their absolute position, perhaps. I mean, in a way, the absolute position has done better than their relative position, you could have. You're saying that they've gone from... No. I mean, it doesn't look desperate looking at that picture to me. We see the consumption by, I don't know whether this includes uh, health care and such or not, but we see consumption rising. Yep. That's the most yep. striking thing. Um, the, the young don't look so different than the 30 to 49 year olds. Well, I would say the young of, uh, well, they fall in a bit in absolute terms. By the way, it doesn't include, in the UK, the health care is socialized. So health costs are not uh, in this. This is um, uh, a private consumption. Um, the uh, it's interesting. I mean, yeah. I mean, they've. I would say there is a gentle downward trend, but the older people there's a strong upward trend, uh, and it is lower than it was, but you're right, it is not massively lower than it was. I, mean, I would say, actually, it's the relative thing that's really striking. Now, and I turn to this a bit later, got some other evidence on it, um, going back to the assumptions on which social policy rested when uh, I was in government, an almost unchallenged assumption was old equals low income, that you have you, all those services that were free for over 65, it was a good way of targeting poverty if you make some a service or an income available for people aged over 60 or 65. Uh, this is telling you that that is less and less effective as a form of targeting. In fact, now we're at the stage where we're saying free for the under 29s would be a better targeted social policy than free for the over 65s. But you're right, it is that one. Um, uh, the pension increase is more dramatic than the younger person's fall. So, uh, I talked about the environment. Where were we? Yeah. Now, you kindly said, well, I've been in a position to have an influence on policy. And I, was, I served in David Cameron's cabinet as Minister of Universities and Science. I was involved in public policy. I left the House of Commons in 2015. Uh, so, this is what my party has done in government since I left office. Uh, and it is, this is our resolution effect, which is we look at all the benefit changes and tax changes which the government has implemented um, or announced for implementation up to 2023 24. And we look at how they affect people in different ages. And basically, there has been a freeze, a cash freeze, so real term cut in some family benefits. And there's in the UK a very generous policy on upgrading state pensions. So that the effect of the on different on um, families headed by people of different ages is, as you can see, a very significant benign policy to for older people relative to young people, heavily influenced, I would argue, by the voting age and the size of the cohort. Um, Ah, oh, yes. Now, this ties in. This is another a, a slightly different presentation, but the point you're raising earlier. So this is a this is median income after housing costs per household, adjusted for household size, um, on a different uh, breakdown than before, working age versus pension. And uh, so you can see in the median, uh, consistent with the other consumption, story, but you can see pensioners, pensioners going up. And again, in I, uh, my book came out at almost exactly the day, but I still think a really historic change in the distribution of income in society happened. The point, at the, the point which I never thought, a lot of you never thought would ever happen, where the median income of, a, of the pensioner household exceeded, after housing costs, exceeded the median income of a working age household. And Britain went through that point in 2010 when the first edition of my book came out. 
Uh, and uh, it's, as you can see, that's ran a bit, but uh, they've not opened up a commanding lead. But nevertheless, essentially now, the, the median pensioner after housing costs is better off than the median person working age. Whenever I say this in the UK, I get told, oh, but there are lots of, of poor pensioners. And this is the, the lowest 20th percentile point. Where if anything, the story is more dramatic, it's because of what I was saying earlier about the value of benefits. It's clearly the case now that the, a poor pensioner at the 20% point will have a higher income than a poor family. Um, though it is still the case that the, mo the 80th, 80th percentile affluent working age family is a bit ahead of the 80th percentile uh, pensioner. But nevertheless, this... I guess this, and again, you must tell me whether there's anything like this happening in America. I think it's probably something like it is happening in America. If you had told me, I arrived in the British Treasury in 1978. I worked for Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s. I worked on social policy. I never thought we would reach a point when the middle income pension is more affluent than the middle income working age family. And that is what is now happening. So it's again a, and I'm not even saying it's a bad thing. In some ways, you could regard it as a fantastic success of a whole series of social policy interventions boosting the incomes of poor pensioners and pensioner poverty was a real problem. In some ways it's a success, but we shouldn't assume that a lot of the basis on which policy is still debating in the UK is way out of date. It just assumes pensioners are poor. That is no longer the case. Yeah. When I mentioned here and in the earlier uh, diagram we were looking at, um, if I mean, yes, there's National Health Service, but the the costs of the services, the health care provided is much higher for elderly person than for a younger person. And if if that were included, then these would look even more. That is a, that is a very fair point. Yeah. It's, it's, and um, I have a bit of a discussion of the welfare state later on. But, and you're correct. The, uh, uh, and indeed, the... the well, I'll, I'll turn to it later, but, but I, I, your observation is absolutely correct. The, the NHS is above all for old people, a little bit for young people, under five. You know, you use the NHS healthcare system a bit when you're, when, uh, you're pregnant and you're having a, and you've got a very young child, then you, it diminishes and massively increases as you get older. Mm -hmm. um, so I've told an income story so far. I've talked about wages, talked about housing costs, talked about uh, the effect of the tax and benefit system. Now turning to the asset story. And there are two main assets in the modern economy, your house and your pension. Uh, and in Britain, uh, again, I think you've had the same thing in the US. We have had a surge in, the, in house prices, particularly in London, which is the upper chart, but uh, not just in London. Uh, and these are real house prices and just shows uh, what has what has happened, how much they have increased, they've gone up several fold. And for many families, including affluent families, I think what first got me onto this was conversations with my wife about sitting in our house in West London, which we bought 30 years ago, um, and has shot up in value, and asking how our two kids, wondering how our two kids were ever going to be able to afford to buy a house, anything like the one that we had. Um, and again, it's another anxiety that the older generation have about the younger generation. So house prices have increased. And I would say there's a, there's a widespread belief it's unlikely that this kind of effect will carry on for the next 40 or 50 years. So you've got here a, a wealth effect, a group of people who were playing a kind of game, the housing equipment of past the past, they were in there holding the past where the house prices were, were shooting up, these amazing surges that we've had. Um, and as house prices have risen, the proportion of families that can afford to own a house has fallen. Uh, and for me, as a conservative, I remember the Conservative Party in the UK, I believe in a property owning democracy. I think I want to spread, own spread ownership. Uh, and in the UK, the story has been the opposite. In fact, ownership peaked for all families in 2003. For young people, Again, this, which is the yellow line, the story is most dramatic. Uh, it peaked in 1990 with half of young people owning their own home. 
that same age group, 25 to 34 year olds, down to a quarter owning their own home, there was now modest recovery. So a massive reduction in home ownership amongst the younger generation, the sort of logical equivalent of that increase in private renting. So they can't afford to get onto this housing ladder, whilst we boomers sit on these assets that have shot up in value. Uh, and that is a big challenge. And the other challenge is pensions, the other big asset. Well, there's been a similar wealth effect, though it's harder to uh, capture, which is that, and again, I think there's been something similar in America. Um, the older generation have got what we call defined benefit pensions, salary, final salary linked pensions. Uh, the costs of those have increased, and companies have shifted more people into personal pension options, 401ks, what we call defined contribution pension schemes. Um, and companies put much less money into the new defined contribution schemes than they used to put into the old defined benefit schemes. So if you are working for one of those big companies of the past, you know, those massive motor companies, if you're working for Chrysler 30 or 40 years ago, large amounts of money going into your pension, and quite possibly in the UK, and I believe in the US, still going in in order to plug deficits in the pension scheme, still being used to preserve the company pension system. And those revenues count in the big economic analysis, that, those, that money going into company pension schemes counts as a return to labor. But it is only a return to the people who have pension rights in these defined benefit schemes. And it comes out of the revenues being owned by to those companies, by younger workers who aren't even members of the scheme, but their work is generating the revenues that are putting the money into defined benefit pensions the old people have. And another pension effect, the hidden wealth effect, is if you have a defined benefit pension, which basically promises you a pension when you are above a certain chronological age, we will pay you two thirds of your final salary from the age of 65. And you have unanticipated increases in life expenses. That changes the capital value of that pension promise. And that pension value effect is actually almost as big as the house price inflation effect. Uh, so those pension promises that older people have from these company pension schemes have turned out to be more value than was ever expected because of increased life expectancy. There is no similar effect if you've got pension pop. Now the longevity risk, instead of being borne by the company, is borne by the individual. So if you've got a million dollars in your pension pot, which is not bad, uh, but if you've got a million dollars, it is only a million dollars. If they work, work out you're going to live for 30 years, another 30 years, not another 25 years, that just means that your annual income being taken out of your pot falls. So there is no wealth. In future, there will be no wealth benefits for increased life expectancy. There's been a one-off special, uh, one sort of special offer to baby boomers with age-denominated pension promises who have had a massive wealth effect on their pensions, which will not be. So both for housing and for pensions, the two forms of wealth, it just so happens for both of them, it looks again as if the big, big generation has had two striking wealth a surge in house prices and an increase in their actual wealth value of their pension policy. So the wealth story is, if anything, even more dramatic than the income story. And that's why in Britain, and again, I apologize, I don't know the American figures, um, but that's why in Britain there is this enormous concentration of wealth in the hands of the boomer generation. And this is not simply the life cycle effect. To some extent, it is a life cycle. I forget. You would expect you might expect in a society a 60 year old to earn more than a 30 year old, and just perhaps a 90 year old to earn a little bit less than a 60 year old. So there is, of course, a life cycle where you build up your savings and you start to earn them down. This is more than any feasible life cycle effect. This is also a one off special bonus for a particular cohort. Uh, and as you can see, it's both, it's significant, it's both. In the UK, housing, if anything, even bigger, the wealth in the, in the pensions. Uh, and yes, this is, this is one of my, and this is how, this shows how these surges in wealth 
just tracking of every five years, the surges in wealth that we've been following through this millennium have all been concentrating on people at the far end. And you would not believe the number of property owners, older property owners in Britain, who think that the reason why their house is shot up in value is they have scripts and saved it and build a conservatory. And I have to break it to them gently. It is not because they scripts and saved it. It's because land values in big cities have shot up. It is not a reward to their exceptional virtue in being so prudent. Uh, so there is a very large wealth. So I've told you the income story, I've told you the wealth story. Let's come back now to Ron's interventions. And again, and certainly in the UK, we have quite a large welfare state. Let's look at the sort of the public expenditure, governmental side of this. And this is um, largely government forecasts of it, not of how the cost of the British welfare state will rise with no changes in the value of the promises. So we're not, we're trying to assume, of course, you have to make some heroic something. We're trying to hold policy constant, but just feed, so uh, the policy on increasing the value of pension is constant, but you just feed in the number of pensions. And so, a bit more complicated for health. We allow, for, we have some assumptions about increasing the cost of healthcare, but also there's the demographics, and more often you take some more healthcare. Now, what you need, and again, this is distinctive about Britain. What's quite interesting, well, the overall picture is, as you would expect, basically the welfare state, which in Britain costs about 25% of the GDP, is heading for over 30% of GDP, which I suspect are bigger figures than in America. And you see, we broke it down to its three main elements. The younger people do get just about a fair amount, you know, some education spend, not massively increasing, nothing very exciting, they get some education spend. On social security transfers, not as bad as you, as you might expect, because we do have in the UK quite a mixed economy on pensions. We have a lot of private saving, island company pensions, or new personal pensions, and also, and I did argue for this, this is one of the things that I do take some pride in, we have at least in the UK got quite aggressive increases in the state pension age, which is one way of saving money on pensions. The pension age is rising. It's already, it is in the moment, we're in the moment of crucial transition and, uh, where it just starts to increase above 65. No, uh, it, first of all, we increase the female pension age to reach the male pension age of 65. And now pension ages for men and women are identical and we're slowly increasing until 66. Uh, and we have a formula for future increases in the state pension age. So the combination of a fair amount of private provision and increase in the pension age means that unlike, say, continental Europe, where a lot of the welfare state does pensions, we're relatively okay on pensions. However, the British model is a bit unusual. We have a, a new, we have a fairly privatized pension system. We have a highly socialized health system. And the real increase, as you can see, from health spending are driven by older people's access to the NHS. And so, uh, and I, again, I say this to my colleagues, I say that um, if you really want to understand Thatcherism, Thatcherism was when we were in that demographic sweet spot. Thatcherism, and we were also extremely cutting the value of the pension. Thatcherism, those bad periods when we were bringing down taxes and controlling public spending, was the demographics of that period in the 1980s when Britain was at the sweet spot, the boom of broad working age, relatively few old people, relatively few young kids, concentration of workers, as we all know, very faithful to demographics. Um, we're now heading for a very different environment, which is why my friend Boris Johnson, I'm not a Brexit here, I'm a Remainer, uh, I'm not his government, but I get on with Boris, why Boris, in his Conservative manifesto, barely promised any tax cuts. We are now in an environment where tax cuts, which used to be the standard political weapon of centre-right parties, are just not credible because of the public expenditure pressures that all governments face. Now, when those programmes are programmes that will benefit Older people, of course, eventually they'll benefit everyone, but the real surging cost is associated with the baby boomers. But who's going to be paying the taxes for? You can't 
horror of your own, you then do the same piece of work and say, well, what happens to taxes in this rising welfare state scenario? And it's that purple block on the right. So these young people who pay a stock rising, whose housing costs have increased, who can't get started on the housing market, and whose pension promise is worth less, also face significant tax increases in order to transfer resources to the older people who are going to be heavy users of a publicly funded healthcare system. That is the next part of the story. And for me as a politician, the question I put to my own generation is, are we absolutely sure this is politically sustainable? Are we absolutely sure the, um, that the younger people will be willing to foot this bill unless we treat them rather better than we have been doing for the last 10 or 20 years? I think it's an American bumper sticker. The American bumper sticker, by the way, being one of the highest literary forms known. In terms of the distillation of an observation, there's one American bumper sticker be nice to your kids, they choose your nursing home. And that is a very important message for us to bear in mind. Are they really be nice to them? Because are they going to be literally funding our nursing homes and will they be willing to do so? So the burden of the welfare state is the next political challenge if you look at things from this generational perspective. Now, this is a rather sort of heroic figure. Um, and Professor Sir John Hills at the London School of Economics has done a methodology on this, and it has certain parallels with the fantastic work that Ron does on national transfer accounts and generation accounts. Again, what we try to do is holding, uh, is our, holding future tax and public expenditure policies constant, work out every generation's, every age group's net position at the end of their lives, where they are net paying in and net taking out. Because when I was a politician and said all this, the boomers who were demanding their generous pensions and their free health would say, I have paid my contributions, I've paid my taxes, I paid my taxes during my working life, I'm now entitled to get the money back, I'm only getting my money back. Um, this shows that the boomers are going to be getting back in total far more than they put in. This is the net position, the cost of the welfare state, once you add, add, add minus the taxes they actually pay. And I have a guilty feeling, so having worked on public policy and social policy in Britain for 30 or 40 years, thinking I was doing so in a high money way, it so happens I was born in 1956, and I seem to have managed to <laughs> put myself at the position of absolutely maximum net benefit. Now, some benefit is a good thing in, in an economic growth environment, where successive generations are better off, it's perfectly reasonable for us, as, we, as I said right at the beginning, to say, well, we're going to boost the pensions of old people above what is actually the value of what they paid in. That is part of a continuing social contracting of generations. But again, it should be broadly stable. What you shouldn't have is one sort of special effects of some kind of what you seem to have got away with very favorable net returns, much greater than the net returns of other generations, the people who had a tough time in the depression and the war and the young generation today. So again, it looks as if the welfare state is delivering very large net transfers to this uh, generation. So when you were born really matters. And being born in a big cohort really matters. And it seems to be shaping politics in Britain. And again, you can tell me to what extent there's a debate in the US about age and voting behavior. But this is probably what you think British uh, politics uh, used to be like. And this is the share of votes by social class. And here we are, the 1974 British election, when social class is ABC1, 56% voted Tory, and only 19% voted Labour. And the working classes, which in those days was manual workers, in flat caps, going to work in the car, car factory or the steel factory or the dockyard, 57% of them voted in Labour. So class was the dividing line between Conservative and Labour. Look at class in British politics. I'm afraid we haven't yet got the analysis for the 2019 election. This is the 2017 election. Virtually no class difference in voting behaviour. Lots of middle class people voting Labour, lots of uh, uh, 
uh, low income people voting for it. Virtually no blue red divide. Because now blue red is the other way around from Georgia. Right? Blue is on the right, and red is on the left. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Um, so no, no social class effect. But what would you expect? Now there's an age effect. Age is the new divide. And my party, the Conservative Party, gets an increasingly high proportion of the older people's vote. And, the lay, and, and gets a declining proportion of the young person. But I like what we say, having worked for Margaret Thatcher, you know, in this, when, in, in, and conservatives nowadays find it amazing to think that there was a time when the proportion of third, people aged 30 voting Tory was almost as high as the proportion of people 90, were voting, voting age 70 were voting Tory. We have policies like freezing the, the we cut the real value of the state pension. We did a lot. Now, my party is under massive pressure to, from the older voters and their attitudes. They're the ones who vote for Brexit. They're the ones who don't wish to have capital taxes. Yeah, they're the ones who do want public spending on the NHS, which is increasing. And they are a very large um, cohort. Because if you look at age 70, is in 2017, go back to that a very early chart. That night, in, in, for those 70 year olds, they were born in 1947. That was the year when more than a million babies were born. Given the success in modern life and improving life prospects, most of those million babies are uh, still around. Otherwise, those 70 year olds are a very large, powerful cohort. They're absolutely a peak, they're the first peak of the baby boom. So we shouldn't be surprised that parties are pitching policies to them. Uh, now, I am, I'm going to come to an end in a moment, but I'm to, and I'm going to end with uh, what I think is um, the most important kind of backdrop for economic policy through all this. Um, and I believe this phenomenon is the same in the US. If you take what I was telling you as the micro story about what's happened on housing and what's happened on pensions, and think of it <coughs> as an overall story about assets and wealth. To some extent, this is the Piketty problem. And the, uh, in this, this, on the right, if you look at the right-hand axis, this is telling you about household wealth as a percentage of GDP. And back in the 60s and 70s, household wealth was about 300% of GDP. It was about three times GDP. We're now in a position where household wealth has increased much more than GDP has. The household wealth is now seven times GDP. A country where wealth is seven times GDP is very different in character to a country where it's three times GDP. For example, inheritance matters a lot more. How much money your parents have got, their wealth is really important. Getting from income from earnings to asset ownership is much harder. Inheritance matters more, earnings count for less. And we have, I think, often an unnecessarily complicated debate in Britain about has inequality got worse or not? And just to give you my take on that, and this is only a slight simplification of the evidence, um, since the 1980s, when there was an increase in income inequality, basically, income inequality in Britain has not got worse in the last 30 years. Um, so if you look at assets, you could, let's be very favorable and say in pretty much asset inequality is not what much worse. However, also think of a society, which is by and large true, where assets are less equally distributed than income. So without the statistics showing an increase in the inequality of income, or showing an increase in the inequality of assets, if nevertheless assets have grown relative to income and have become more significant, that shows up as a society that feels more unequal. And I think one reason why we have these rather confused left-right arguments about inequality is I think it's the asset income ratio, which is the crucial driver of this feeling that the rich are doing all right and it's harder for the poor. It's because getting from income to assets has become tougher. Uh, and meanwhile, I don't know what's happened for you in the US, down here, this left-hand axis is the 
portion of GDP being taken in capital taxes. And even while capital has been rising relative to GDP, it has been pretty flat on only 2.5% of GDP going to capital taxes. This peculiar dip in the middle was Mrs. Thatcher's experiment for the poll tax, for local yeah. taxation. But basically, capital taxes contribute no more revenues than they did when before any of that wealth surge happened. So we're not taxing this increase in wealth. We're taxing income a bit more, taxing consumption a bit more, but we're not taxing capital a bit more. And that's why, even for me as a conservative, I have said, look, there is a fundamental wealth challenge here. It would be, it would make sense for my party to have some extra tax on capital in order to distribute it to the younger generation. And I propose ten thousand pounds citizens' inheritance for every young person when they get to the age of thirty to be used either to put into your pension or to deposit to buy a house or as uh, to enable them to start a business or to enable them to pay for education, including paying off debt if they wish. So. We need to help younger people get us asset stake in society. And the only way to do that is to use the power of government. And I think this is actually a conservative message. Um, I think oh, that's a complicated message. It's a conservative message. My hero, uh, Edmund Burke, <coughs> Reflections on the Revolution in France, uh, about the state as a, com as a partnership uh, 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 it becomes a partnership, look at the thing, uh, not only between those who are living, but between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who want to be born. And almost every worthwhile institution in the society has that sense that we are inheritors of benefits left to us from generations that came before, and a desire to pass on those benefits, if anything, in even better shape to the generations coming after us. I happen to think that two of the most powerful institutions doing that are first the family, and second, if I may say so, in this environment, the university. For long, it is no accident that universities are some of the most deep-seated, long-lived institutions we have got. In a brilliant survey, I think it was a great Clark Kerr actually who first made this point. In a survey of Europe's oldest institutions, <coughs> institutions that Europe had had in the year 1500 and which still has today, by far the most prevalent, significant group within that set of institutions more than 500 years old were universities. So, institute, so universities and families are both fantastic examples of the intergenerational contract. We should all try to practice it in the policies we support. And my fear is in Britain, my generation is currently failing to live up to that high principle. Thank you very much indeed. If I may, uh, how would you tax capital compared to the money? Well, uh, we have, uh, there are several options. Our inheritance tax in the UK is a classic bad tax, namely at a very high rate, that sounds scary, 40%, but starting at a very high threshold of a million pounds. You should, uh, so one proposition would be to have a lower rates of inheritance tax kicking in at a lower threshold, 20%, count over half a million or whatever. Um, our capital gains tax is extinguished on debt. Uh, you could make another sort of indirect way into it would be to say capital gains tax liabilities and not extinguished, so they are a burden on the estate. Um, I didn't get into that slide on social care towards the end, but you could say more social care should be funded in the form of a charge on the estate, which is collected after the person is done. So there is, there is a sort of shopping list that we have looked at, resolution management, those sorts of things. You didn't mention the annual health tax, which is the tax due to were in the United States of states to rise energy campaigns. Right. Um, and on that, sorry, the, oh yeah, I see the bill as well. The, what we do have is we have this um, local tax called capital tax, uh, called council tax, which is a sort of, is partly a property tax, and could be a lot more progressive. It collects proportionately much less from high-value properties than from low-value properties. And we have also proposed 
uh, and that is an annual charge um, as a proportion of um, capital value that has to be put those in the form of stats and more assets. So nothing on financial or business assets. No, I mean other, um, we have not uh, we have no the short answer is no. Yes. You know, you've had long interest and involvement in universities and university funding, probably by extension, broadly in funding for education as a whole. And there is a distinction between the proposal that the uh, last slide had, which is essentially uh, enabling consumption compared to putting that same 13,000 pounds broadly into a broadly distributed education investment that then, at least in theory, might generate further returns. So I wondered if you could talk a little between the consumption and human capital investment side of yeah. our uh, inheritance fiction. Yeah, and, and um, uh, you put very courteously a question which is something that I put to me much more brutally because in my time in David Cameron's cabinet, I was Minister for Universities and Science. One of the most controversial policies as I went through was an increase in university tuition fees from £3,000 to £9,000. And so a question that I do sometimes get put is what does the author of the pitch Think of the policies of the university's <laughs> minister. Wasn't the university's minister one of the worst examples of exactly the sort of behavior that the author was going to screw on? So uh, I would say that, that in the UK, our education funding model is different from the US. When we say student fees, we do not mean that people actually having to pay real money, and we don't mean people having to borrow from banks or credit cards. It is essentially a, a paper transaction where the government lends the young person the money and they pay back only when they have a sufficient income and as a proportion of that income. So they basically now the funding from there is 9% of their earnings about £25,000. That makes it progressive. The, and when higher education was financed out of classic public expenditure. One of the ways in which government controlled public spending was controlling student numbers. So the government did allocate for every university a fixed number of places. And that um, was a restraint on the growth of access to higher education. The critics of my proposal said, these fees are going to put young people off, and especially kids from poor backgrounds are going to go to university. What I said, and fortunately seems to work out, is that no student is actually paying up front. It's a graduate payment scheme. So you shouldn't be, if you've got a low income family, that's not as if you have to pay off your poor parents to help make the costs. They're not. So there's no reason why anyone should be paying put off. But because it is ultimately a graduate payment scheme, we can get rid of the number control. So my model was actually where it gets an expansion of education, which is indeed what has happened. So the, there are more young people going to university than before. The more affluent will pay back to the graduate tax. So less affluent will never pay back. And if they're in less well paying jobs, then the generality tax base me. And I think that is a that is that uh, it was driven by exactly your models. It is an invest, a capital investment in higher education. And the 9K fees actually increase the unit of resource per student compared to the old public spending model. So you've got extra resource per student and an increase in the total number of students. And I have to say, I follow the California debate, um, you know, the pressures in the, in, in the California debate. There are some people who are now advocating. California University finance scheme, rather like mine, a progressive graduate repayment scheme. And so, whereas in the British debate, mine was seen as a really right wing pro market reform, I think here in California, my proposal would be seen as towards the left wing end of the spectrum because it is saying the state should 
start off by funding every young person going into California first. Yeah. So how likely do you think that your uh, conservative colleagues and uh, electorate can support the uh, well, um, I think the there are two. The, the sort of the immediate test is social care, and I, I didn't flip that slide. I'll be getting into one. But the the kind of the hot issue in public policy at the moment is um, old people going into either need domiciliary care or going into nursing homes, meaning residential. Where we have a confused and very imperfect system. Boris Johnson, only in the last week, Prime Minister Johnson has said he will come up with a policy for social care in the next 12 months. And the logic of what I am saying is the generality of testimonies, which includes people with low income, in particular the working age population, should not be the funders of social care. Much of it will be used by people in quite high value properties with quite generous company pensions. So it is an argument, but we're not there. then the pressure comes back, hang on, using an asset to meet an annual bill is very tough. That's why you have to have a structure where you, you reclaim, they build up the debt and you reclaim it off their estate. Not totally like the, the student model. But if Boris Johnson says, the old person's estate has to meet some of their social care costs after they die. And I would regard that as a best of this agenda. If he says taxpayers, including taxpayers on quite low incomes and all these young people, have to pay higher taxes or their taxes are going to fund social care, then I would regard it. So that is the immediate test case. And down the track is how you meet the increased cost of the. NHS, and again, it's which which taxes you rise, and there I will argue for reform of capital taxes in the UK <coughs> rather than increases in taxes on revenues, and that's a debate we'll have to ten years. And I think that is winnable as well, but we will see. Social care debate is certainly. <coughs> yeah, um, I'm wondering. You've shown this enormous increase in, I'm not sure exactly how you characterize it, household owned assets relative to GDP. Yeah, like household wealth. Yeah. And so that now up to something like seven times GDP, right? which seems uh, uh, capital GDP ratio is more than three. No, it's similar in the US. And then there's some national debt to offset that, but that wouldn't offset so much. Um, so what I'm wondering is, as those holding this wealth, who are mostly elderly people, uh, die, um, are bequests received by people who are no longer so young, but will be in their 50s, but are they going to be enormously higher? Yeah, and that's a, a, a very fair question. And the answer, um, now the answer is, first of all, quite a lot of it is this, it's pension. Mm -hmm. And it's pension wealth in the form of company pension promises, which are extinguished on death. So it's not all heritage. Mm -hmm. The pension element is not, there are some tweaks in the system. That it's, a, it's a reasonable base case that pension wealth is not heritable. Uh, the housing wealth, you're right, is heritable. The uh, and in fact, we do some work on this moment the Resolution Foundation. Although there has been an increase in inheritance, it is definitely going up. The increase in the value of estates bequeathed on death is not quite as much as one would have forecast given what this has been happening to housing. 
So it looks as if there's also an increase in inter vivos transfers, as we call them. So in other words, one thing that families are doing is they're borrowing a bit against the house in order to give money to the kids to help get them start on the house, that kind of stuff. Transfers. And that is a big social mobility issue. So there's both very low levels of tax on the states, and I mean, we, uh, we read that you have a sophisticated national service industry, there are various forms which you can borrow against your housing asset. So it looks as a lot is taking the form of untaxed, unrecorded transfers to a uh, to the younger generations of the certain housing. And so, and indeed, one of the other issues in my book, I and mean, it's where I'm looking at boundaries in my case. That is, I mean, because a lot of people, old people say, yeah, I'm actually doing the best for my kids. And they're saying, we may be better parents than we are citizens. We, part, we are trying to discharge these obligations one by one. Um, whether as citizens we're discharging it to the younger generation as a whole is uh, much more crystal. And this would be very unequal. Exactly. Exactly. But so, uh, something like three quarters of the household wealth would be, of the heritable wealth, would be uh, housing, and maybe one quarter would be ownership of stock. Yeah, the, the financial, the, the little turquoise in turned into that financial. Uh, it's not, it's, it's bank accounts and uh, holdings of shares and things like that. Um, the, uh, yeah, so housing is is important. We don't know, and again, going back to what I was saying earlier on social care, um, we don't know how mortgaged that wealth will be by the time this rich generation of boomer asset owners die. It is possible that the kids who've been waiting patiently to inherit a million pound house will actually find it's half a million after, they, and they discover that parents had a lifelong mortgage, which they used to maintain a high living standard. And they may find there's a bill for the social care costs. And they may even find some of it was to give money to them when they were younger. So at the moment, it looks as if this inheritance is both unequal, but it's not quite as big as people thought it would be. It's a bit like you go, you go to the attic in the grand house of your parents and open up the golden chest in which you expect to find the wealth and you instead find a set of loan notes and uh, debts to be repaid to the bank. There's a risk of that. Yes? Can you explain the policy about how much house you can own and still be supported by the state uh, in your plan now, Mr. Thomas? Because there's some issue there, isn't there? Yeah. Um, there is a, uh, this is complicated, but there are various, there are various models. There's a, there's a, uh, there's a cap on costs and there's a, a floor. I mean, there are, there are various models, but you would have most, most proposals say we will, there's a limit to the total amount that we will charge you for the cost of your social. It could be fifty thousand pounds. It could be a hundred thousand pounds. Um, but the sort of nightmare scenario, which is taught, creates a lot of politics around it, is you get dementia and you're in a, an expensive care for a decade of your life. So one of the ways this policy is attacked is a group called dementia tax. So you have to say there is a cap on the total amount you have to pay for your social care. And, uh, there are various uh, uh, possibilities. Um, and the second thing is a floor below which your wealth does not fall. Uh, and again, you could imagine, well, it's not you the same thing. You could say um, your you're always going to be left, you have a lot of 150,000 pounds to go out. So you, um, and now there's a lot of political debate about that. 
And there's a political debate about whether these costs include domiciliary costs. But the basic idea, I think that there's a widespread view you need those two protections in place. In the Conservative Manifesto of 2017, they were not in place. So you have a protection for the return of the money you pay and a protection for the minimum amount of your assets that you keep. And after that, you are then exposed to, say, um, there are, however, people on the left who say this is all ludicrous. Why are these complicated tests? It should just be a state responsibility. And in places like Germany, it is just a function of the state. And to be frank, in normal times, if I were looking for a legitimate expansion of the role of welfare states, the kind of German model in which this risk this is a classic Bismarckian social insurance risk, uh, there would be a state policy of funding social care. I don't think it's inherently absurd. My opposition to it now is I think that given the balance of our taxes of its I think it's generationally unfair. You will end up putting out income taxes or national insurance contributions for the younger generation. And these people who will be getting free social care will be owners of a lot of their wealth. And that's why I am up for this rather more elaborate debate about how you get a charge if you put a bit of a cap on the total amount and the floor of the rest. Yes? Yes. On this issue, my parents live in Illinois, and the rules there are that you need to consider long term care because you're calling it an auxiliary cost. Uh, that, uh, that they basically bring up the charges on your house, but they the, the, uh, put two items possible to use to live in the house. And that, 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 that. So we have something like that. Um, my, my general uh, impression is that, that I agree with that kind of generational Wisconsin and how things and new quality literature. Yeah, I got it. But what surprised me here was, was the uh, the fact that, that people who work don't have more income than people who are pensioners. It's kind of funny, actually, I've been touched with it for 11 years myself, and I'm surprised how well I'm doing it. There's a lot of things that come in from not having income. But it's just my case, it's a, a general case. Um, and so I'm reading, I'm reading David Graeber's uh, Bullshit Job. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm just in the middle of it, so I can't talk the whole thing. But basically, it's like, it, Combined with Dr. Grass near the beginning of the presentation, that work is just not that valuable anymore. I mean, yeah. you know, in, in Graver's book, it's basically yeah. that, that you basically are just, it's all vanity driven. And, and the fact that it doesn't come up in dollars and cents and, and graphs sort of yeah. the way it's that underlying that point. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think there is a, for me, there's a real erosion of values. If, if working hard in a decent job, is not a way to get a house. Having rich parents who lend you some money from their house is a way to get a house. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've done some estimates at Resolution Foundation. We take at the minimum deposit you would need to get an average value of house. And we've then taken typical earnings, and on those earnings and typical levels of consumption, how long do you have to work to get the deposit? And when we were boomers, it was kind of three years. Now it's more like 19 years. So the gap, so the route into home ownership is not through work. And I think this is very bad for society. The route into home ownership is through inheritance, is through having rich kids who, because they're worried about this tax on inheritance of a million pounds, um, start giving you money early. That's how to get a house. And it is a profound change in the values of the society. And not a good one.